This is my fourth session of the day and my last session of the conference. I'm excited to be here. My name is Jim Yannick. I'm an end user computing architect within uh, EUC tech, uh, tech enablement within the uh, EUC business, business unit at VMware. Hello, everybody. I'm Ray Heffer. Um, I'm a senior EUC architect in the same team as Jim, uh, based out of London, as you can probably tell from the accent. This is my sixth session of the week, <laughs> but the last. So obviously, we're saving the best till last. So thank you. Absolutely. For and we've got a big room and a lot of people, so that's great. I, I think what we'll probably do is handle questions towards the end. I think we'll have plenty of time for questions. So we've got some mics in the audience to ask questions. And it's, it's really hard to see from up here with the lights up to see you guys. So uh, we'll, we'll keep that for the end. So what we're going to talk about is we kind of kept the abstract a little bit vague and said Horizon 6. But obviously, we announced Horizon 6 version 6.2 this week. So we're going to talk about the features for 6.2, as well as, at the same time, we're going to be shipping a new client agent update. So that'll be 3.5 version. So we're going to talk about all those features as well. So this will be kind of the latest and greatest. So disclaimer, uh, we, we are talking about futures in the sense of you know this week kind of thing. Can so, I just read all yeah. this word for word? No, yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, please. Let's, <laughs> let's read that. <laughs> And then uh, you guys have probably been to a few end user computing sessions uh, and seen these slides, so I'll be really brief on this. Uh, obviously, uh, Workspace Suite is talking about all of the things that we do within end user computing, everything from Horizon Desktop, which is what we're about to talk about, to AirWatch Mobile, um, content management, as well as the ability to get to all of that through the newly renamed uh, VMware Identity Management. AirWash obviously has been uh, top of the heap for quite a long time. It's one of the reasons that Sanjay Poonin acquired AirWash and one of the reasons that we're investing so much in AirWash. And very happily for us, uh, IDC uh, named us the leader of the pack in the desktop space. We're very excited about that. That's been a lot of hard work for us over the last seven or eight years. So uh, really excited to, be, to have that happen. So what we're going to talk about today, as I said, is Horizon 6.2. This release, although it's a dot release, actually has a lot to it. Uh, there's, I, I, we broke it up into a couple of categories here. So uh, sort of loosely platform features, integration with other parts of vSphere and, and other things, as well as uh, client and agent. CART stands for Client Agent Release Train. That's one of our little internal things. But version 3.5, so I already mentioned that we've got some new clients coming, as well as a new agent that will run on those VMs. So as I said, there's a bunch of new features. Uh, instead of reading all of these from the agenda, I'm just going to kind of jump into each one. So first, this one is one I'm really happy about, and a lot of our customers are really happy about. From day one, when we started RDSH uh, applications, people asked, are we going to be able to stamp those farms out in mass? Are we going to be able to use Composer to do that? And the answer today is yes. So now we have the ability to use Composer uh, to create link clones, to create RDS, uh, what we call an automated RDS farm. Obviously, the big benefit here, single image management. I can crank out a bunch of hosts all in one, uh, one go, uh, some storage savings. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, the big thing here is I can update OS, I can patch, I can add applications really quickly and simplify the deployment. Just a quick show of hands. Yeah. Who's using RDSH yeah, today with curious. Horizon, if we can see you? A few of you. Okay. Yeah. So just a refresher here for uh, anybody who's not familiar with Link Clones, the way this is going to work is we're going to start with a master RDSH VM, and we're going to create a Link Clone off of that. And what, what we do is from a snapshot, we, we create the Link Clone, and a, le a replica gets written out to a data store. And from that replica, which is really, in, in essence, the boot drive, we create Link Clones. So each of the individual machines are, are a separate link clone, a separate, separate object. And if you've got multiple data stores, we'll just write replicas on each one of the data stores and put link clones on each one of those data stores. Uh, one of the big things that that does is helps us with saving on storage. Um, this has not been as big a deal recently or in, in former years because typically you have to have a lot of spindles, especially when you're talking about spinning disk in order to handle the performance. And so we had all this extra storage space. However, now that we're looking at using 
uh, more and more flash storage, uh, if you're not using dedupe and inline compression, uh, then saving space makes more sense. So in, in a classic VM, if I got a 20 gigabyte VM, 100 of them, I'm looking at you know a two terabyte SAN. I'm just gonna build the bottom out. With link clones, obviously I can save a lot of space because I'm just writing that replica out, which is my 20 gig instance, and then I've got a bunch of link clones. That five gigabyte number is a really, really big number for link clones. It's, it's a, a, a really awful worst case scenario, but we still show you're down at you know, 540 gigabytes instead of, uh, instead of two terabytes. You're really probably gonna have a much, much smaller link clone because you're gonna be recomposing fairly often and maybe using SE sparse volumes to keep that cleaned up as well. And something just to mention here uh, as well, it says two gig of RAM. And the reason it says that is you'll have a virtual yes. swap file. Right. I would certainly recommend for RDS 8 virtual machines, reserve all the memory. If you reserve 100% of the memory, you've eliminated the virtual swap file. Yeah. So that, that's going to save some storage as well. Yeah, good point. Really good recommendation. So view composer and RDSH farms. So within the, 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 the wizard to create your pool, we now have not just a manual farm, but an automated farm. So that's, that's new in the, the 6.2 wizard. You can use your standard naming pattern like we've been doing with link clone desktops for a long time. Um, really just the same as composer desktops. I can also set minimum number of servers that are available during a recompose. So in this example, I've got 10 servers that I'm building in this farm, and I always want half of them available during a recompose so I have continuous operations. And finally, uh, it does support sysprep and using a customization spe specification. So we're using sysprep specifically and not quick prep for RDSH farms. And then this chart just gives us a little bit of a view of the differences. And the, you know, visually, this looks like, oh my, they don't have much functionality for RDSH servers. But in reality, most of those X's are because uh, that use case doesn't necessarily make sense for an RDS-8 ser server farm. Like, for example, a rebalance, we reckon you're just gonna, gonna stamp out a new, uh, new, new farm on, a, on a, new set of, uh, a new set of storage. Same thing with refresh. Um, we're, really, you're just gonna, gonna recompose those, des those, uh, those servers. We don't do manual naming because really that's, that's about tying existing computer accounts with specific users and since users aren't involved in the server itself, it doesn't really apply. And the same thing with the other, the other pieces here. It just doesn't really apply to the server use case the way it does to the desktop use case. We've also enhanced the load balancing capability available with uh, RDSH servers. So in current shipping versions, uh, the load balancing is really just based on session count. So now we've added a couple pieces in. So now I can use perfmon counters on the servers in the farm and we ship uh, a couple of default ones. We'll show you that here in a minute. Uh, to be able to see what the load is on each one of those servers for the first line of how we're going to balance out sessions. And then the other thing we can do is we can set anti-affinity rules. So uh, if we've got applications that we know are going to take up a, a, a lot of resources, we can say if we have X number of that application running on a server, we're going to send sessions to another server in the farm. So I can combine that counter data and those anti-affinity rules to really uh, build a nice algorithm for placing sessions with a lot more granularity. There's some administrative work to set this up. You can continue using just the basic session count, or you can use this. A lot of our larger customers have asked for this because they wanted to have much better control over how sessions were getting placed on RDS servers. So just to take a little bit more of a look on that, so the first piece of this is uh, the Perfmon uh, counter. So we ship a couple of scripts. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, I don't. I thought I had another piece on there. We ship a couple of scripts out of the box, uh, one for memory and one for CPU utilization. Those scripts will run on each server in the farm. We recommend running the same script on every server so that we're coming back with the same results. And what happens is that script runs periodically and it returns a value back to the connection broker. Everything from a block, don't put anything on this server, to uh, hi, this is the most uh, desirable server for you to put a session on. And then when the, when the user comes in to get a session, we stack those, those, uh, those servers up and say, this is the most, the, the most obvious place for you to put a session. If you already have a session going and you're running an application, we're just gonna give you that session back. Like you've disconnected and reconnected, we're just gonna put you back on that server. Or if you're, creating, if you're launching another application, let's say you're already running Word and now you wanna run Excel, we'll just stick you on that same host so that you're not on multiple hosts. 
And in addition to the, uh, the scripts that, that come back with the perfmon counters, we also give you the ability to do application anti-affinity. So I can stop a user from connecting to a server based on a, a count of an application. So in the example here in the screenshot, uh, we're using a, um, an application here that's, that's obviously going to have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, it's going to be taking up a lot of resources. So we only want that to run if we have two copies of that running on a server, we want to refuse any other sessions to that server. We want to push them down to the next server. But I don't know if you can see that. It's a bit small, but it's AutoCAD. Yeah, it was AutoCAD. That, that's a clue to what's coming later, because why would you want to run AutoCAD on RDSH? You, you'll find that out. Yeah, later. yeah, exactly. We, we do have a reason for that. <laughs> and and I, uh, I, I knew it was AutoCAD because I actually created the slide, but I just completely went <laughs> blank there. I was reading something else. Um, so. The thing about this is we'll first figure out the order of uh, the, from Perfmon, and then we'll process these rules to say, okay, if, th these if this application is running, we're going to put you onto the next server or the next server. Now, just like uh, with uh, the Perfmon counters, we have a magnetic session capability here. So if I've already got a session running, or if I'm using an RDS desktop, so I'm not using single applications, but I've got a desktop and running applications in that, we're just going to leave you on the server that you're already on. It's a, it's a magnetic session capability. What we're trying not to do is have you launch a bunch of different sessions on a bunch of different servers when all the applications you need are on a single server. So that's why you want to run AutoCAD. Yeah, raise foreshadowing. Uh, why you might run AutoCAD in an RDS host. Now we will support 3D applications on RDS hosts. So um, 3D support for RDS hosts with uh, Horizon 6.2, both VDGA with NVIDIA and Grid vGPU with NVIDIA, Windows Server 2008 R2, 2012 R2 as well. Um, this gives me the ability now to not only have uh, 3D desktops, but to have that flexibility to provision individual 3D applications as well to users. So a couple of things about this. Um, it's going to require a, a dedicated VDGA or shared grid vGPU on the server. Uh, check the compatibility guide. We've got the, um, the, the compatibility guide that we update. NVIDIA also updates the compatibility guide. They've just announced some new cards this week. If, you've, if you follow this, they've, they've announced some, some new next generation cards, much more powerful than the ones that, they, that are out, the K1 and the K2, which we've been supporting all along. On the RDS H host, now when you install the view agent, there'll be another uh, option uh, that you have to select, and that is I want to do 3D. So I have to turn on 3D RDS H when I install the agent on the host, in addition to having the hardware in place. Um, what it should look like in Device Manager, and this happens automatically when you, uh, when you turn that on, is that the NVIDIA grid will show up in the, in the Device Manager as the active uh, VGPU and the standard uh, VMware one will be turned off. And we just kind of threw this in there as a little tip as you're, as you're installing here. There's this uh, nifty little utility called GPU-Z that you can download and you can run on those hosts so you can see what's going on when you're running applications to see what's happening when, uh, when those GPUs are being used and to see what level of usage is going on with them. Cloud Pod architecture. So we've had Cloud Pod architecture now since Horizon 6, so a bit over a year. Uh, we've been adding features to Cloud Pod architecture. Earlier in the year, we gave you the ability to set it up completely in the UI. It used to be uh, simply command line driven. Now what I can do in addition to, and I guess I should talk about what is Cloud Pod architecture for those of you who don't know. Um, it gives you the ability to link view pods together. So if I've got a 10 pools of desktops, maybe in the same data center, and they're separate pools, but they're really the exact same desktop. I've got a fairly large healthcare customer that has this exact situation. So now I can put them all together into a single global entitlement. So when a user logs in, they see that they're entitled to this Windows 8 desktop, and it may come from one of any of those 10 pools. And we don't care which one it comes to. We'll load balance across that. Um, it just gives us the ability to extend the scale of, of view from beyond a single pool to multiple pools. Just on that as well, yep. Jim, I've got another example yep. for you guys. Um, there's a car manufacturer in the, in the UK, and before, they, they, they've been using Vue since you know, 4.x, 4.6, and obviously they're on Horizon 6 now. 
Prior to cloud pod architecture, they had a pod in one data center and a pod in another. And their approach, despite me saying, please don't do this, is to have uh, 2,000 named users in one data center and 2,000 in the other. And of course, as time goes on, it's a complete mess. They don't know who's meant to be connecting to which data center. This has solved it for them. They, they use a load balancer. They're both active sites. The user can connect to either data center. These are opposite ends of the country, and it doesn't matter. And as far as the user cares, they just want to get to their desktop. So they launch their Horizon client, and there's the desktop pool. And what it's doing, the load balancer, and, and by the way, cloud pod architecture does not provide load balancer. Right. You still need F5 or another type of load balancer there. But they connect to one of those pods in one of the data centers, and they connect to a desktop. And you can do a whole bunch of other stuff. We won't go into that now, but you can have rules to say, yeah, you always need to be connecting to this data center, because that's where your applications are. Or you may say, no, just connect to the nearest location. So it's really powerful. Yeah, we've got a lot of good material on cloud pod architecture. It's worth taking a look at, especially if you're, you're in any of these kinds of situations. With this release, we've added the capability of doing RDSH applications with, uh, with cloud pod architecture. So previously, you could do VDI desktops, you could do RDS desktops. Now you can add entitlements for RDSH applications as well. Uh, the way this looks is uh, we give you a global entitlement. I really spent a lot of time and energy on these screenshots and named them really cleverly. We, we all need a global calculator. Global calculator. Global I mean, who doesn't need a global calculator? So this is kind of showing actually what would be some, something of a bad practice, but a, a, a local entitlement and a, a global entitlement to a, to a particular application. But it, it, it allows me to do this now with, uh, with cloud pod architecture, which I couldn't do. <laughs> Um, this is going to work with any of our um, Horizon clients, including, and I'll give you a little more for foreshadowing, HTML access with CloudPod architecture. And I have to have the Horizon Agent 3.5, which is the one we're shipping here quite soon, or higher on the, uh, on the RDSH hosts. We're also adding to CloudPod architecture the ability to do HTML access. So now I can look at those global entitlements through HTML. Uh, I've got a screenshot here of, of the HTML access. Earlier in the year, we released the 3.4 version of our agent and client, or our HTML access agent, and we added kind of a cool sidebar there that you can pull out and actually manage what's going on within your browser. So I can launch new applications. I can shift between different applications. I can log out. It's actually a really nice for a bit, a bit of functionality for the, the browser access. I definitely recommend you play with this. First thing you do, you start dragging all the windows around in your browser. It's, it's cool. <laughs> it's it works. actually fun. Um, a bit more on HTML access. Um, you configure it in the global entitlement policy. So. One thing I will tell you, you can see there in the, the check mark, when, you, when you're setting up the global entitlement, you've got to turn this on. You also have to have it on in the RDS, RDS farm. So when you create the RDS app, uh, server farm, there's also a checkbox there for HTML access, which is just general HTML access to RDS applications. So I have to have it on there, and I also have to have it on in the global entitlement, otherwise the user won't be able to use it. Um, so I set it up with each global entitlement, and uh, again, uh, a Horizon 6.2 connection server and HTML access 3.5 or higher. The HTML access component will install automatically with the, with the Horizon agent when you do install that. Yeah, I think on 3.4, you had to install that. You separately. had to install separately. And now with 3.5, that's installed for you. Yeah. And that's really based basically because we happen to be shipping Horizon 6.2 and the, uh, the 3.5 agent at the same time, so it's just part of the installer. For those of you who are involved in uh, the federal space, uh, at least in the U.S. here, uh, we're adding uh, Horizon 6 FIPS common criteria certification. So we'll add FIPS crypto to all the Horizon Windows components, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we're, we're in, the, in the midst right now of the actual common criteria certification process. So we have a third party who's actually doing all of the audit work around that, and that's targeted for some time in the first half of uh, 2016. How many of you uh, does yeah, this just, resonate just, with an interest? Anybody in bit? Fed? A couple of you. Yeah. A few, okay. A few. Um, FIPS mode is, op is optional. It's for, it's for customers who really require it. In fact, you probably won't even see it as an option when you go to install because you actually have to have Windows in FIPS mode before you can install the view components in FIPS mode. We're also going to support VDGA pass-through with AMD hardware now. Uh, so we've been doing this for a while with, uh, with the NVIDIA hardware. 
We're adding this with AMD so I can provide 3D acceleration for uh, VDI desktops, uh, unsupported hosts, and supported AMD GPUs. You'll need to look at the compatibility list for specific AMD GPUs and specific hosts. It's a lot like NVIDIA in that regard. It's not just going to be any uh, graphics adapter that you, uh, you pull off the shelf. And here, in a little more detail here. Um, There's a test on this at the end, isn't there? There is a yeah. test on this at the end. There is. So it's going to be supported on select hardware, as I mentioned. Um, it's very similar configuration to NVIDIA. It's, it's, it's the pass-through configuration. Uh, you're going to refer to uh, the 3D rendering for uh, Horizon 6.2, 3D rendering for desktops documentation for how to set this up. You will need the AMD drivers within the, within the desktop virtual machines. We leverage some, some APIs, and those APIs only apply to certain cards. So the rapid fire and ADL APIs are what we're using. And it supports, you know, for those of you doing really high-end 3D graphics, 640 by 480 resolution all the way up to, <laughs> all the, way up to the high resolution. This is one we've been waiting for for a while, and it's one-way one trust support. I had a customer ask for this about four years ago. Oh, yeah, it's, very happy yeah, it's, now. It's, been a, it's, been, it's yeah. been a request for a while. So uh, what this really applies to is I've got uh, a domain, and I've got connection brokers in that domain, and I have users in a separate domain. We've traditionally had to have a two-way trust. So for a lot of environments, they don't want to have a two-way trust between their domains. So now we'll support a one-way one trust. It can be a forest trust. It can be just a standard external or realm trust. It doesn't matter. Uh, if it's a forest trust, obviously, we'll, we'll support the child domains. And I'll, I'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, the way we pull this off is we've added a, a command flag to the VDM admin command, a dash T flag. And with that, I use it to set up a secondary credential for my admin users. So if I have you know, five admin users within, within Horizon, I set up a secondary credential in that external domain for each one of those users. And that, that secondary credential is just a plain old vanilla user that can go and, and you know, read, read from the base DN and, and you know, read, the, read the directory information so that I can get those users and then entitle them to desktops. I don't have to do anything with the users specifically, but just for the admin users. Just, just on that, yep. if you're using two-way trusts today, it doesn't mean you've got to rip it all out and start replacing it. Exactly. So that, that can, that's still supported. This is just a, a additional functionality. Yep. And then, as I mentioned, if you've got a, a, a trust to a, a forest, an external forest, a one-way trust, we'll, we'll enumerate those child domains. And if you want to add users from, from the child domain into the, the broker domain, we can, we can entitle those desktops. Again, we just have to have that secondary credential up in that, that parent domain to be able to do that. And we've added a really cool little feature that I, I like. Um, we give you the ability to clone a VDI automated pool. So if you've got link clone pools and you need to stamp out five more pools that look the same, I can go pick the pool, hit the clone button, and create a whole new pool based on that pool. So instead of having to go through the entire wizard, I can just create another pool based on that first pool. And we've added a little more licensing information in the console, uh, especially for big organizations that have a bunch of different license key. We would just say that your license was valid, but really didn't give you any clue what license you happen to be using. So now what we do is give you an obfuscated view of that license. So now you can see, oh, that's, where I, that's the pod I applied that license to. We're also giving uh, both concurrent and named user counts now within the, the uh, console. And it's over to you. So we're not done yet. No, there's, there's, wait, there's, there's more. A lot of stuff, isn't there? <laughs> um, you'd, you'd think this is like version 7 or something, the, the, all these features. And yeah, you can see there's a whole ton more. So again, I'm not going to uh, list these out now. I'll, I'll dive straight into it. Access point. Um, this is fantastic. You know, I'm a Linux guy. Um, I don't know if you were at my session this morning. You know, I love Linux. We've had a Linux appliance for vCenter um, for some time now. So you can have a Windows vCenter server or Linux. But now we have something called access point. It's running SUSE, Enterprise Linux, version 11. It's a hardened appliance. Um, and I'm not going to use the word replace. It doesn't replace the security servers. This is an option you can use in, instead of security servers. So you can see in the diagram here, we've got two access point appliances in the DMZ, or DMZ, yeah. for you Americans out there. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, and you see on here we've got added security for um, uh, multi-factor authentication. Smart card support is tech preview, so with the 6.2 release this will be tech preview, but you know, it won't be long and that will be supported. Um, I think this is great because it's very simple to deploy. It's just a Linux appliance like you deploy any, any other Linux appliance. Um, and obviously you just scale those out. In terms of scalability, it's the same, uh, it says here, yeah, independent of the connection server, but it's the same scalability as a security server. So we say today, if you're using, for example, PC over IP secure gateway on a security server, 2,000 connections, exactly the same. That doesn't yep. change. The, the, one of the differences is the pairing is gone. So I don't have to pair an mm. access point with a connection server. So I don't have to do that whole one-to-one -one pairing thing. And, and as Ray said, it's not a replacement. We don't expect you all to go run out and replace um, a access point with a security server with access point just because you're upgrading to 6.2. It's just a new option. In fact, how many of you use vCenter on Windows? Hands up. OK, great. And how many are using vCenter appliance? Ah, oh, that's just what I thought. 50-50, yeah. there you go. So I think it'll be the same with this. Yeah. vSphere 6 update 1. So that's the latest uh, update for vSphere. Obviously, that's supported. Um, so Horizon 6.2, when that's released, um, will support that on day 1. Um, yeah, there's some, it, Jim's mentioned this before, the interoperability matrix. Uh, there's there's a, a link down the bottom as well for partner web. Just make sure that what you're doing is fully supported. So there's database uh, compatibility in there. So if you're deploying this from scratch, look at your database, you know, for things like a composer database, um, events database, make sure that's supported. But yeah, nothing's changed there apart from vSphere update one support. And vSphere, V, uh, sorry, Virtual San, or VSAN, I should say Virtual San. Virtual San, I think, is their who, official. Who, yeah, I know. Who's been to one of Rawlinson Riviera sessions? That guy's nuts, isn't he? So, yeah, this, this is great. Um, okay, so this is all Flash. This is new. So, we support all Flash with Horizon 6.2. I don't know if you can see in the diagram there, you've got some SSDs and just what looks like a, an NVMe card or some very fast uh, PCIe uh, Flash storage. What we're trying to explain here, is there's a two-tier model. So the, the cache itself, which is on very fast, you know, that one NVMe card, for example, fast you know, tier of storage, um, is, our, is our cache. We've got persistence tier as well. So this is our lower cost SSDs. So it's an all flash virtual SAN nodes, all flash array. Um, but we, we're using the, the more expensive for, for write caching. Um, and then the, you have the write intensive cache. And then obviously, we've got our persistent data on the SSD. So, 90,000 IOPS is what we can see up to per host. It's, it's incredible. And we've got a reference architecture published actually on the, the previous version of, of Virtual SAN and, and, and Horizon um, that's out there now, and that's the link to it at the bottom. And you can expect to see, I believe, three or four more in the few, next few weeks coming from partners uh, doing uh, reference architectures on Virtual, virtual SAN on, on Horizon. It's actually a, a really great option. And especially if you own advanced or enterprise, you already own the, 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 the right to use virtual SAN from a licensing standpoint, so it's worth taking a look at. Yeah. So uh, stretch clusters, and this one I'm really excited about as well. So virtual SAN can now do stretch clusters. So this is virtual SAN 611. Uh, yeah, 61. Uh, sorry, 61. Yeah. Um, this is great. Well, there's a few things you need to consider here. So it's got to be less or equal to the five milliseconds latency. So don't do a stretch cluster if you've got a data center in London and one in China and it's 300 milliseconds. That's going to not go down too well for you. But yeah. um, you know, it will go down, but not. It the will way go you down actually, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, some other limitations: um, failures to tolerate the maximum FTT. There is one. Um, with, with that, but this is fantastic for Horizon, um, and I can see some really good use cases. Uh, and I know customers today are using app volumes as well. So for app stacks, if you've got that on Virtual SAN and that's stretched, you know, it's going to really add some more op options to your design. Because up until this, you would have to have app stacks in another data center and use some sort of storage replication to replicate that and manage that separately. So we can do this now. With yeah, and this, is, this is brand new. We, we've, we've, done, we've tested it for Horizon 6.2. I would expect in the, in the next several months that, that you'll probably see some reference architecture work around this as well. Um, so yeah, user environment manager. Um, who's using user environment manager yet? Well, formerly Emidio. Anyone out there? one or two. So user environment manager, this is a new, new functionality to provide client information 
um, at logon. So stuff that would be normally available after you log in um, that you might need. So I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, printing is a good example. Yeah, printing is a really good example. We, uh, the, the big thing here is with, with a u user environment manager, we can, trigger we can trigger changes based on dynamic changes. So a really good example would be healthcare and printing, right? So I'm, I'm moving from endpoint to endpoint. What we do is we give that endpoint information. So within Horizon, we maintain this volatile environment set of variables, and it's all based on the information we're getting from the client endpoint. So if I change endpoints, maybe I've moved from floor to floor, uh, user environment manager can say, oh, he's not on floor three anymore, he's on floor two, so I'm going to give him a printer that's on floor two. This just hands that information about the, the client to, uh, to uh, user environment manager even before, during your login process, really early in your login process. It'll also hand it anytime I reconnect. So if I'm moving from station to station to station, I'll get an update. Yeah, and it's stuff like client IP address, for example. Right. So, yeah, that's great. And then, so we mentioned CART, the client and agent release train. We've got all this going on as well. So, yeah, so there's a Brothers Horizon 6.2. This is the client functionality. Let's dive into each of those. And there's a big oh, mess because there's two pages. This. There's two pages. So do you remember the first page? No, we'll, we'll step through each of these. And you will get a copy of these slides, by the way. Uh, these will be sent out normally about a week after, after the event. Yeah. So, yeah, let's start with the first one, client drive redirection. So essentially what this is doing is you are using your local device, you log in with the Horizon client, any local drives, any network drives, um, external USB drives, for example, can be redirected to your, to your virtual desktop session, or in this case, RDSH as well. Um, so that's really good. Um, what else can I say there? Yeah, encryption. Um, this is using compression. Um, there's something, I did, a session I did this morning called the Horizon Sizing Tool, because obviously you must make sure you, you take into account your PC over IP bandwidth when you're sizing or, or designing a Horizon environment. Just bear in mind that client drive redirection uses a separate port, so you need to look at the, the bandwidth used um, for that as well. Yeah, um, and I, th I think we've got the port got documented that, yeah. in there too. And, and the big thing here is we actually released this feature in the client 3.4, but we added the compression and encryption in this version, and we've also brought Mac, Mac clients up from a tech preview to fully supported. Yeah, and oh, Linux, uh, by the way, I think the next slide mentions yeah, this. Yeah, there's a slide. Linux, um, so this is the Linux client, not a Linux virtual desktop. Um, so if you're using the Linux client, so you've got a, a you know, Linux Ubuntu, for example, on your laptop, and you've got the Horizon client, and you're connecting to a Windows virtual desktop, um, then we have client drive redirection from your Linux client as well. Um, this is, this is, yeah, it's exactly the same functionality. There's a tech preview as well for Linux, isn't it? Is yeah, that's the tech it? preview for yeah. Linux. Yeah, sorry, it's up on the yep. title. Um, one thing to mention with client drive redirection, whether it's Linux or RDSH or Windows, is don't use it with, don't use USB redirection and client drive redirection together. Um, why? This performance would be terrible. Um, yeah. Much, much better performance with client drive redirection than you're going to get with USB redirection. It's, it's working at a higher level than just plain old port redirection, so we're going to use a lot less bandwidth for it. So there's a screenshot of the Mac client. Um, when you log in, um, there's the preferences here. This is a, a screenshot from a Mac. It's actually my MacBook over there. Look. Yes, it so, is. Um, there's a screenshot. Um, it's as simple as that. You can just add the folders you want to be redirected. So I've got a folder called VMware in there, or in my, my user directory, or of course that could be a, a network drive or a USB drive. So it's very, very easy to use for the end user, very self-explanatory. Um, when you log in, you'll see this dialog box pop up for the first time. So it will ask you, do you want to share your local files with your remote desktops and applications? Um, the user can tick, don't show this again, but it's good to know that that's there. And obviously you can go into preferences and sharing and edit those settings as well afterwards. That's what it looks like. Um, it's pretty much the best of screenshots, but you can see I'm in this, in this case, it's an RDSH session, and I've got my home directory on my local device redirected as well. File type association. This is, uh, I've been waiting for this one for a while. Yep. So this is great. If you're using, um, you've got PowerPoint, for example, on your, and, you, and you, you're using that on a published application in RDSH, on your local machine, if you double click on your PowerPoint um, on a shortcut, it will launch that file on your RDSH session. Um, you have to have the Horizon client 3.5 uh, to use this. It's only 3.5. Um, and even if you're not, the Horizon client just has to be present. You don't have to be logged in either. If, you, if you're not, 
if you're not logged in, you have to, it will prompt you to log in. So Correct. it's not like that functionality, you have to be logged into the client and then minimize it. it as long as you've got that 3.5 client installed, that will work. Yeah, and I think the next slide has the detail, but this is the Windows client only. Yes. It doesn't have a detail. Okay, I was wrong. Yeah, Windows client only. So, yeah, thin print, static printer name support. Anyone using thin print out there? This is the virtual printing. Okay, great. Yeah, we've got a couple of you. So, basically, what, just to, for those that don't use thin print, if you have local printers attached to your Windows device, um, the thin print will redirect those to your virtual desktop. That's what thin print does, it's virtual printing. Um, it's very efficient. It works, thin print, in fact, the guys are in the solutions exchange, so if you've got time, go and see them and, and see what they're, they're working on. Um, this is something we've had since the, very, I think since the beginning, Yeah. for, for, for several years. Um, the, the big problem this solves is uh, uh, within, within a session, so you'd connect, and this is really, really, uh, we see this a lot in hospitals, right? So I'd connect, and we'd enumerate the printer. And what ThinPrint would do is give it the printer name, plus it would tack a client ID on the end of it. So it would be, you know, HP LaserJet. Wow, that's an old school one. <laughs> HP LaserJet, you know, XYZ. And then you disconnect and reconnect, and you'd be on a new client, and then it would call it HP LaserJet ABC. And the, the application would get confused, and so you'd have to exit the application and go back in. Now what we do is, it still needed that client ID, so we just whack that into the registry, but we keep the printer name the same so that the application doesn't stay confused. So when I move down the hall from station to station, my printing still works without me having to go through anything. Yeah, and this is virtual desktops or RDSH sessions, by the way, so yep. it supports both. And yeah, Windows 10, so you saw uh, yeah, the keynote, you saw Microsoft on stage, and yeah. v VMware loves Windows 10, and yeah, we've got support with Windows 10 uh, from day one as well on this. Um, minimum of vSphere 5.5 update 3, obviously we, we recommend the, you know, vSphere 6. Um, and Link, that's renamed to yeah, uh, so, yep. Skype for Business, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It keeps catching name. me out, it keeps yeah. catching me out, but yeah, I still call it Link. Um, I've got a slide on that, in fact. Um, OS X El Capitan, um, that's supported with 3.5, so if you're using your Mac and you want to upgrade to that, um, just make sure you upgrade your Horizon client as well to 3.5. And we'll always up recommend you always use the latest Horizon client anyway, um, regardless. iOS 9, that's supported. I'm going to skip through some of these because they're fairly self-explanatory. Biometric authentication, so this is great. Uh, I've got an iPhone, put your, your fingerprint on there and you're logged into to Horizon, and that's great. It's uh, nice and easy. I got so used to that. I use LastPass as well. I don't know if you guys did the same. It's, it's just fantastic to use biometric. Um, this is iOS 8 and iOS 9 for, for the uh, thumbprint support. Yep, and there's a bit of administrative setup. You've got to turn this on. It's not automatic on the back end, so you've got to entitle it and, and set a few things, but uh, really great for the users, obviously. I mean, I, I use this for four or five apps on my phone, and I just love it. In fact, I get angry when I reboot the phone and have to actually yeah. type in the password. <laughs> I can't imagine you getting angry. No, no, no. <laughs> right, Linux. So, yeah, Linux, back to my favorite topic. So, we have the GPU support for Linux. So, for those of you that looked at Horizon uh, for Linux, these are Linux virtual desktops um, in the early access. And we had about 500, between 500 and 600 customers signed up to the early access. It was really impressive. But we used to support VDGA only. So, this was direct pass through of your NVIDIA card to your Linux virtual desktop. Um, and now it's vGPU uh, with, with Linux as well. Um, this must use Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6.6. .6. So in terms of the distributions, if you're using 3D, it's fairly limited today. Um, so 6.6 .6 is supported. You'll probably find if you use CentOS or Ubuntu, you can get it to work, but this is the only supported uh, option out there. Um, obviously, use certified application drivers. So there's applications, like I know Katia for Linux is quite old now, but I've got a customer using that, and this is obviously of great interest to them because they've just deployed this using VDGA. So obviously now they're looking forward to the benefits of vGPU as well. VSGA, um, this is now supported with Linux. This, interestingly enough, is 7.1 of Red Hat Enterprise Linux only. Um, again, this is primarily due to testing efforts. You probably find you could get it to work on, say, CentOS, but this is the supported, uh, supported distribution for Linux. It says shared vGPU, but it's, it's meant to say VSGA yeah. on that slide. Yeah, it is. Um, you, OpenGL, basically if you're using Linux 3D applications, you've got OpenGL running, uh, Katia is one example. Um, when I test it, I just go install some games because that's, that's better, better for testing, for research purposes, obviously. Obviously. 
Um, and yeah, this works fantastic. So if you've got a, a grid card, for example, um, you can use that. And go and speak to NVIDIA, obviously, as Jim mentioned, they've just released the Maxwell M60 and the MXM, which is the, the blade version. And it is double the density. So there's, there's two GPU cores on the M60. Um, but VSGA is K1, K2 only, is that right? Yeah, VSGA is K1, K2 yeah. only. And then the, the, the previous, the VDGA, is, is the Maxwell M60Q. So this is another thing. If you've played around with Linux desktops in Horizon, you'll notice that the, when you, the user logs off, the sessions just sort of sat there. So we've enhanced this a bit. There's automated guest log off now. So it allows the admins to, to log off users after a disconnect. So you end up with a situation where that session was disconnected if they've just closed, and it would just sit there forever, disconnected. So you can see now there's a, a time, time out there. So log on after you know, two hours, for example, in there. So that's good. Uh, this, this was really important because we had a, customers who were, were obviously using this for pretty high-end workloads. You know, they're doing uh, VDGA graphics or vGPU graphics, and, and uh, then they'd log off, and somebody else would want to use that session. It would sit there, so now we'll actually... All right, Basically, they'll, they run yeah, out of sessions. Yeah, yeah, we'll actually free up those sessions so somebody else can grab them. Jim, can you it's please a, explain? It's a, <laughs> it's a picture of a yak. Uh, if you've been to any of my sessions, that's... Uh, I always put a yak in the slide, uh, and really, uh, what I'd like to say is, you know, we're not done yet. We still got some stuff to talk about here, and we, we want to do questions. But uh, we'd just like to ask you uh, to fill out the surveys when you uh, when you finish. If you like the session, let us know. Uh, if you didn't like the session, that's something you can just keep to yourself. And if you, yeah. Nice picture. Is it 4K resolution? Because we support that. It's, we do support 4K resolution now. Foreshadowing. <laughs> Oh, seamless transition. Okay. <laughs> you can tell we've rehearsed this bit. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> 4K resolution support. Um, this is not 4K monitor with the high DPI scaling. It says there somewhere. Um, the bottom, yeah. So this is single monitor support, Windows 7, Windows 8, hardware version 10, the usual stuff. This is a theme going on here. 3.5 of the client, 6.2 of the agents. Basically the latest of everything there. Um, you can see there's a screenshot in the top right. There's the, the resolution. That's the 4K resolution. Um, so just to, to be clear, this is not 4K guest resolution. So not the monitor support with the high DPI scaling. It's 4K resolution of the virtual desktop itself. Anything you want to add there? That's fairly self-explanatory, I think. It's a pretty picture. It's nice. So you should have put a picture of a yak in, I in the monitor there. Here we go. Link 2013 or Skype for Business. Um, there's a blog that I did a few years ago now for Link 2013, where it just talks about the connection flow and things. So obviously now we, we support our DSH sessions, which is great, and Windows 10. Um, just bear in mind, if you're using Link, there's a VDI plugin that Microsoft provide. Um, that's Windows only, that plugin. So if you're using zero clients, you can't use the VDI plugin, because obviously it needs a Windows uh, OS yeah, on the yeah, client. In fact, right now, Windows clients only for, for the endpoint. So that's, it's, uh, it, that's a big area of confusion. We have people constantly, you know, oh, we want to do it on our zero, or we want to do it on our Linux endpoint. And yeah. right now, that's, uh, that's IP that Microsoft has to be convinced to, uh, to add. So if that's something you're looking for, like, for example, doing it on the Mac or Linux, you should let Microsoft know that. Uh, well, we definitely are eager to work with them on that. Yeah, and the, the point here, this isn't just for chat. Um, this is video, one-to-one -one video calls, yeah. calls, that kind of thing. Yeah, chat, chat works fine. Uh, this, is, this is video and voice. Yep. Yeah. Look at that, nearly on time for questions. Yeah, we've, we so. wanted to leave plenty of time for questions, so we did. So if you want to just step to the mic and uh, Yeah, there's a couple away. of mics at the front here. So, the and this session's recorded, so if you yep. could uh, use those mics, that'd be great. We'll be happy yep, to. have got a question over there. Do you mind using the, there's a mic sort of in the middle here. Um, I got a question. Hi. Right. So on a, on a Windows, right, when you do a screen resolution change, you get two options, keep changes or revert changes. Yes. If I'm connecting to my VDI on a non-persistent desktop, it asks me to log off for that screen resolution change to kick in. And when I log off and come back in, it's, it's nothing. Right. So how do I, because I have customers asking me to fix it. So on a non-persistent desktop, so... It, when they log off, does it do a refresh at log off? Is well, that how you got it configured? Desktop. It's a floating pool. Yeah. The only way to do that is persistent. So you can use link clones. You could say, you know, rather than floating, still use link clones, but make that a, a dedic you know, dedicated so they, they keep, that's the only way of doing it. Yep. 
If you do that with linked clones, obviously you think, well, what's the point? Because the linked clone will grow and things like that. Use things like SE sparse. But if they're going to end up on another desktop, we can't follow the resolution. There's no, nothing in there that we can sort of have a persistent resolution following them around today. Yep. So I guess, why is it asking me to log off to re re adjust that's, the screen? That's, that's what's confusing yeah. me. That's Windows. That's just Windows. That's asking, Windows. Yeah. Right, but on a regular laptop or desktop, it doesn't actually do that. But it's because it, because Windows knows it's a remote session. Okay. That's yep. the only reason why. Yep. But it, yeah. Okay, got a question here. I'm kind of curious if there's a, a plan to move the, uh, the session control server to a Linux platform so that it's an appliance. Yeah, it's a product manager question. Yeah, well, that's, that's not a question we can answer right now. Possibly. I'm oh, with possibly. you there. I think that would be great. Yeah. But, yeah we wouldn't sorry. be opposed to it. <laughs> Yeah. Are there any plans to support the Teradigi Epix cards with RDSH uh, applications? Again, that's up to the vendor, isn't it? That's, yeah, I, I'm not sure if we're working. Have you asked Teradigi that? I'm not yeah, sure. Of yeah, of course. Yeah. They say ask us, do they? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> D don't know the answer to that. That's the remote experience team, and it would be a product manager question. Okay. Sorry. Thanks. Okay, if there's no more questions, no, thank you very much. Oh, you oh we one? have a yeah. question. Sorry. Is there a plan to do a migration from the Windows VC and the Windows platform to the appliances? Because right now you can't swing from Windows and SQL to the appliance. In so the to my, from Windows Virtual Center to, yeah. to the appliance. There is some, someone's blogged about that. It's not an official migration tool that I yeah. know of. Um, that's a core question. If you come and hook me up afterwards, I can send you over to someone that can answer that. And, and we'll hang out and answer questions, uh, you know, informally too afterwards. Yeah. Uh, the, the Horizon client, you said now supports, the new one now supports Windows 10. Uh, I think I heard earlier today that App Volumes is not yet to Windows 10, that's uh, later this year? By the end of the year, yeah, that's the plan. Okay. Yep. Okay, any more questions? All right, Quick thank point. you. Oh, go ahead. Access point, it supports Blast as well? Yes, okay. yes. definitely it does today. It's exactly okay. the same. So PC over IP, Blast Gateway. And just yep. one, I know you can't answer it, but I got to say it. Six, whatever release you have of you, it's months until Teradici says, oh, we'll support that. It, it, is there anything you guys can do to get in sync? To get what? In so sync. With so Teradici releases match your releases, so you aren't sitting waiting for months for a supported environment. We can feed that. The only thing I can say is we'll feed that back to product management because it's those guys that will work with them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we okay. feel you pay, we know where you're coming from. Okay. Hi. Our question related to the AirWatch integration with the view administrator UI, is there any plan to combine because I know we had the, the workspace, then there was a secure container which is going to replace the... Uh, yeah, so, yeah that's, a, that, that's a future that they've, they've announced this week, but we don't have much information on it yet on what it's going to look like. So I, I, unfortunately, I don't have much to tell you on that yet. Yeah. Right in uh, vSphere 5.5, can we upgrade um, view 6 to 6.2? If you're st still with the 5.5? Five, five? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, 5.5. Five yeah. five. And we, we put the link for the interoperability matrix, so it, it'll be 5.5, five, but I'm not sure if it's 5.5 five, U1, U2, U3. You have to look at the interoperability matrix, but yes, you can. Any concerns about upgrading uh, View 6 to 6.2? Uh, any problems? No, I've done it. Yeah, I've done I've it too. I haven't had any so, issues at all. Yeah, I haven't had any issues. Um, just follow the same upgrade process we've had previously. There's a, a matrix, you, there's a KB article, with it, uh, and it's in the documentation as well. It's like a table with a matrix of what you should upgrade first in that order. As long as you follow that, you'll be, you'll be good. Yeah. All right. Oh, we've got one more right. question. Uh, the new feature for mounting the local drives yes. is that can you control the direction of the data, or is it just bi directional? So can I only upload data and not allow no, users to No, yeah. it's by direct. Yeah, you can bring stuff down. Okay. There may be a GPO to turn it to make it one unidirectional, but I don't know. I haven't looked at that. No, we I, Yeah. Great. All right, thanks, everybody. Thank and you again, very much. We'll, we'll hang out if you want to talk. <laughs>